the technical difficulties, but we're excited. Listen, this is Pivot Conversations with Jamie Alexander and a special guest. I'm so excited that he um, made room, okay, in his schedule to join us on today so that we can just hear a little bit more about who he is and what he has to contribute as far as the pivoting. Um, I'm so excited. He has so much wisdom. Listen, I had to just bring him on. And it's so funny, guys. I'll share this real quick with y'all. It's so funny how, uh, <laughs> how, how he just popped up in my on my radar, right? So I've seen Mr. Marquis Gold at the Millions Conference with Pop Prophet Tiffany Montgomery. Then I ran to him again at the I Lead Escape in Atlanta or Powder Springs, Georgia with uh, Tasha Cobbs Leonard and her team. And, before, and when I realized, I was like, wait a minute. And then not only that, y'all, y'all know how I am. I pray. I God talk to me in signs. So I'm seeing no lie, y'all. I'm seeing Marquis' name everywhere. Like I'm driving down the street and I see the name Marquise in these on these apartment buildings that I rarely pay attention to. And it said Marquis. Then I'm in the mall and I see the name Marquis. And I was like, God, <laughs> What are you doing? What are you saying? You know, and so when it comes to when he uh, put on my heart, y'all, to do the whole, because y'all know y'all been following me. I've been um, keep reiterating, prepare, pivot and perform, prepare, pivot and perform. Right. So I've been doing that series over on YouTube. Shout out to my YouTube channel family. I have the broadcast going over to my YouTube, Facebook and my other business page. But y'all, we've been um, doing the prepare, pivot, and performance series. And so I wanted to come and bring on someone. See, y'all, I give y'all what I know, okay? It's a certain limit, you know, of what I know. And you're probably out there like, hey, I want to hear from somebody that's making millions. You know, I'm not there yet. <laughs> but I want to hear from somebody that's making some millions. How can, you know, somebody that's already have arrived come and share some tips. And, you know, I heard that in the realm of the spirit. And I was like, you know what, God, I need you to show me some favor <laughs> and bring on Marky's goal so that he can share um, some tips. So guys, I want to introduce him real quick. Marquis Gold is a business executive dedicated to upscaling the African-American community. Using his platform, y'all, he has produced content for widespread international audiences, being at the center of producing television shows, music, real estate, as well as practicing philanthropy, okay, and artist management. So we want to welcome Marquis Gold to the room. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on in. What's up, there everybody? Is. Hey, <laughs> the man himself is here thank with you, us, y'all. Thank, thank you, Jamie, for having me. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, like I was, like I was saying, yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, do you? Uh, is the feedback okay? Is it breaking? I think I'm a little delayed, Probably, but is it breaking I, on your end? Yeah. Can you hear me good? Yeah, I can hear you. You're a little delayed. Okay. All right. So y'all bear with us um, because I'll let him tell you where he is, <laughs> but just bear with us um, real quick. So we want to talk about, like I said, we want to talk about this pivoting conversation. Um, and again, you probably heard me backstage, but uh, how this all came about was in prayer. And, you know, OK, let me go back a little bit further. So in my ministry, 3030 experience, I released a prophetic word where God is telling us to prepare the people in the next 10 years on the shift that's coming. And so I'm like, OK, right. how, you know, how to prepare the people and it's like you prepare them. And then after they get prepared, help them pivot and then so they can perform in way the flow of the world is going with, especially when it comes to inflation, you know, when it comes to price yeah. changing, when it comes to the value of the dollar, you know, decreasing all of that. Right. So I'm like, okay, God, I know how to prepare people. Like you've been dealing with me with that area for some time now, but when we talking about pivoting, I need somebody that's been doing this for some while now and your name yeah. popped up and I reached out to you. Shout out to Ashley. Thank you so much, Ashley, for connecting us and getting us on this schedule. So I want to just come on real quick um, and ask you some questions to help the people out, you know, especially the African-American community, especially the 
the church because some reason the church normally just seem like the, the church is behind when it comes to the things yeah. of the world. Like the world Absolutely. could be already ahead and the church is trying to play catch up. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I want us to dig a little bit into that. Right. I want us to dig a little bit deep into that um, because like I said, preparing, that's me. I can prepare people all day, all day long. I can talk about talk to you about preparation but when it comes to pivoting when it comes to turning not not turning the vision but actually doing something different to get to the same goal i want right. you just to dive um deep into that right so you said in the millions conference i wrote i wrote the quote down because listen y'all he was dropping he dropped some gems y'all this may follow him by the way follow him on instagram follow him now because he is dropping gems um but you said um learn what uh oh okay you said learn the system of what you're trying to do so that you can get to where you are going i think that was a part of the whole preparation process um which system did you have to learn to get to where you are now First of all, Jamie, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm truly, truly, truly appreciative and excited to be here with you today. Um, I know that it seemed like I'm a little delayed, but it's good to be here. And uh, whatever's happening in the airways and the Wi-Fi, I'm in Dubai. We're going to just cancel that in the name of Jesus. So uh, I really believe that it is important to learn the system. For me, I had to learn the system. Number one for me was life. The system of life. You know, I grew up in the inner city of Baltimore, Maryland, and I was aware of one particular way. And that was, you know, public assistance, uh, food stamps, uh, public public uh, transportation, things of that nature. I didn't know there was another way to do life. I saw people who were living how I wanted to live, but I didn't know that there was a particular way that you had to do to get there. So I started to read. I started to learn the system of life. I started to learn entrepreneurship. I started to research financing. I started to research real estate, all of these different types of systems that literally align with the type of lifestyle that I wanted to live. So I had to learn the system of life. And then from there, everything else became a new system that I had to learn. I had to learn the system of, uh, of church, the system of uh, entertainment. I had to learn how to manage. I had to learn how to, you know, uh, build more wealth. So all of these systems were all learned individually as I compacted and grew in all of the things that I was called to do in life. That's good. That's good. And guys, I'm sorry. I know it's probably a little choppy, but we're going to get through this in interview. OK, we're going to get through this information. Even if I got to type it in the comments, <laughs> we're going to get through this information, guys. So that's that's really good. That's really good. Marquise Learn the system of life. And you know what? I, when you you know, not to over spiritualize it, but when you mentioned learning the system of life and then everything else followed automatically, Matthew 6, 33 popped into my head, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto us. So when we seek life and when you just learn to flow with God, you will start to add on real estate. You will start to add on those other areas, transportation, or whatever areas that you're desiring to go in, whether if it's business or whether if it's your nine to five, whether if it's your career right now, like learn life. And the only way to learn about life is going to the life giver, right? Right. Um, so what does pivot mean to you? Like we have the Google definition, but what does it mean to you? <laughs> So for me, when we talk about pivot, like pivot is, I had to embrace this concept. Pivot is not a one-time event. Pivoting is a lifestyle. So we got to get out of this mindset of, I have to learn how to pivot from this to that and embrace this concept of pivoting as a way of life. So when I think about pivoting, pivoting to me is the ability to shift my weight. It's the ability to shift my weight. So when we talk about shifting your weight, you can go, you can pivot by shifting your weight or your attention from education to real estate or from church to business or from uh, entertainment to uh, philanthropy. Like it's literally shifting your weight and learning how to do this as a lifestyle, not a one-time event. 
I don't learn how to pivot when I'm tired of one thing and I need to go to something else. No, I'm learning how to shift my weight so that when it's time for me to shift, I ain't got to get ready. I'm already used to this. I'm already used to this. So that's what pivoting means to me. It is to, it means to shift your weight. That's good. That's good. That is so good because oh, you convicted me because <laughs> I'm thinking this whole time that pivot is just this one thing, you know, is this one time. So you just straight up burst my bubble. Thank you so much for sharing it because I'm pretty sure, you know, other people probably thought the same, you know, let me just shift this one way and that's it you know i don't have to change anymore but actually guys it's a lifestyle you know it's a way yeah, of thinking you, and and you, with that definition you, that you just gave um, us you, knowing that pivoting is a lifestyle knowing that it is not a one-time event um knowing that it is our way of shifting our way at what point in your life i know you shared it um you know, at, at Millions Conference and uh, the I Live Escape, but I want you to share here on as well. At what point in your life did you apply that very definition of pivot? So throughout the, the years of my life, I started to really take into account the systems of my life and how my life was moving. I wasn't aware of it. But maybe the last five years, I started to really examine all the years of my life. And I started to see how my life by God was being shifted every so many years. And I didn't really notice that. I knew that I was gifted as an orator. I was a communicator. I was a preacher of the gospel. But then every so often, God would put me in another environment and I had to learn how to juggle different types of responsibilities. And so probably around the age of 30 or 31 is when I really started to embrace this concept of pivoting. And I learned that pivoting is not a one-time event. It's not literally going from one thing to the next thing. When you practice pivoting as a one-time event, you get frustrated because as soon as you start something and then it's time to shift your weight again, you start getting frustrated. Like, oh man, I just got into this. I just did this. I just did that. So you have to learn how to make it a lifestyle. And I had to embrace it. So at 33, I felt this full embrace of pivoting. And when I had to do was I, I pivot from being a pastor to God saying, I want you to give me back what I gave to you. And I'm going to take you all over the world to do all these type of things. And I was like, I've never seen that done before. Most of the preachers that I've seen in church, they preach till they die or they pastor till they die. He said, he said, if you study the scripture, most of the people who were quote unquote mm-hmm. apostles or preachers, even Jesus, Jesus ministry was three and a half years, literally three and a half years Mm -hmm. before he was taken back to heaven. Paul started these churches and then he would leave those churches and go on to the next. It was a pivot lifestyle. And so I embraced it fully and I started to learn how to shift my weight from one thing to the next thing. And now it's my lifestyle. I'm so used to it. Like I have in my bio, don't lock me into a niche. Like everybody talking about these niches, like what's your niche and what's the one thing yeah, that you do yeah. you kind of stuff. It's like, bro, God never intended for us to be stuck in one niche. Like we can do multiple things and do it well. We can be this and that we can have that and that, and God can have our hands. I like to say this way. God can make you ambidextrous in the spirit where you can operate with both hands. You can operate in entertainment and in faith. You can operate in fashion. Mm -hmm. and So you have to learn this lifestyle pivot. God requires you in one area. And then he says, okay, now it's time for you to give that back to me and go into this area. You don't become so married to that one thing that you feel like your life is coming to an end. And like he said to Abram, he said, Abram, get up and go to a place that I will show you. He didn't, he doesn't tell Abram, go north, south, east, or west. He just said, go. Obedience is the greatest thing that you can do. And God says, as long as you obey, I'll make sure you get to, oh, I'll honor any direction that you go in. That's how you learn how to pivot, shifting your weight. That is so, y'all, I'm going to throw my phone at this man. (laughs) Oh, this is so good. This is so good, y'all. Listen to what he's saying, y'all, because I know, because listen, because, you know, stuck in 
we can get so stuck in just one box. You know, I'm, I'm going to work this nine to five and I'm going to keep, I'm going to leave it at that. I don't want to do nothing else. You know, tradition, religion mindset. I don't, I'm, I'm just going to stick to this and I'm just going to do this. Um, and then also you shaking the table when people be like, oh, well, if you're dabbling in so different things, you're not showing consistency. Or if you're doing too many things, you're not going to see any results. But that is not pivoting. Like he, he said, you have to be able to do, being able to move and, and, and move around and have your hands. And one thing you actually confirm, <laughs> you actually confirm something that God told me the other day. He said, you can be the prophet and the entrepreneur. And I was like, yes, because so many people can get, can put you in the box. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you read, I don't know if you were, if you read T.D. Jake's disruptive thinking book. But I'm in chapter one and he talks about how yes. people did not, you know, it was so hard for him, people to see him as an entrepreneur because they were so used to him as a minister or people because it was so hard to see him as a minister because he started off in the music ministry. So it was wow. like, oh, my God, this is so good, y'all. So with, with, with saying that. How can the church, because even though you already touched based on it, you know, pastors can, you know, because I have pastors watch and apostles watching, have the whole five ministry watching. Uh, they'll catch the replay rather. Uh, you mentioned how pastors, you know, they're a pastor till they die, you know, and it is not too late, y'all, to, to pivot. It's not too late. You know, if you still have breath in your body, it's not too late. How can the church or the unchurch or anybody that's watching can say, you know what, how can I start pivoting? How can the church pivot in order to function in this economic climate because like i said the church is always trying to catch up so what are some like a few steps that they can do just some progress yeah great question jamie so for me i think the, the number one thing that the church has to do is is take out the complication or making the process so complicated like the thing that the church has done is that we put in so many restrictions and processes in order to get something done so you have to do it this way you have to do it that way and then you have to do it this way and take that step and the next step and we have to make it simplicity think about this Jesus, at the age of 12 years old, finds himself doing his first pivot and no one understood why he did it and what was happening. And that was in the temple. The Bible says that he's in the temple. He pivots from being a child to being a, a, a preacher or a lecturer or a minister. And the Bible says that his parent doesn't even know that they left him. And when they finally go back and find him, they say to Jesus, why have you done this to us? And it's like, no, you did this to him because he's 12 years old. What do you mean? Why have you done this to y'all? And he says, didn't you know I'll be about my father's mm -hmm. business? Like he went from a child to a literal in the synagogue speaking in marvel and they're, they're marveling at his wisdom. Then he pivots from being a person in the synagogue marveling to back to being a son. And he becomes that son, and then he pivots to being a carpenter, and then mm. he goes from being a carpenter to being a messiah. But if we go all the way back to 12 years old, he knew at 12 that he was called to be the messiah, but he doesn't take reign until 30. So the question that the church needs to ask is, how can mm. we simplify this? How can we embrace the the unction of the holy spirit mm -hmm. to just go with the wind the bible says in john he says that you will be able to be like the wind the wind can go in any direction it can, in any direction that it, that it that it feels and we have to do the same thing so one of the practical things that we can do is we can number one stop being so married to what worked yesterday Every time God performed a miracle, they wanted to build a tabernacle. They wanted to build a monument. And everything that God does does not need to, you, we don't need to eradicate some type of monument or some type of ritual, some type of routine. So get out of the routine. It's okay to try new things, experience new things. Like, you know, there was a season where nobody wanted to use, quote unquote, the internet in church. They was like, oh, the internet is the devil. Don't use that streaming and don't use the internet. And then when the pandemic happened, the same people who was preaching <laughs> against had to use the internet. And this is what I mean. It's like, be free. Don't always That's demonize. Easy. 
because you don't know it. Like be free to explore it, to be open to it, to learn. And I think that's the great thing about Jesus' ministry is that Jesus was so open to a new way that they try to demonize him to an old way. So they call him Belshazzar because he healed on the Sabbath or he did things that the, that the Sadducees and the Pharisees wasn't used to doing. Or they try to tempt him with the law or with the scripture when they didn't realize that he was the word. And so he was so free in his practice, so free in his flow that he was willing to expose us to a new way. And I think the church needs to do that. We need to get back to not relying on what we saw work yesterday, but be be so open that we are willing to test God and try him and be open to new ways. This doesn't mean that we get rid of the traditions. This means that we find ways to hold on to that which is true, but also be willing to flow into that which is current. And this is why the spirit flows. The spirit is a, it goes with a current, it goes with a flow. It's like water. Nothing can hold water back. You can throw a log in, in the pathway of water and water will find a new way to go around it. And that's what we have to learn how to do spiritually as a church. And so we have to get out of this concept of, we have to do it this way. And if it's not done this way, it's the wrong way. Number two, I think the church has to begin to explore different things like Christ did. And what I mean by that is that you'll realize that Christ had what we call supporters, funders. He had people behind the scene that was funding his ministry, that was sowing into it, not from the perspective of legalism, threatening people and say, if you don't do this or you don't sow that or you don't tie that, you're going to be cursed with a curse. But what he started to learn is that when you meet people's needs, people don't give, watch this, to needs, they give to vision. So our vision has to become bigger than what we need in the house. It has to be bigger than our local community, than the, than the, than the next conference that we're doing. It has to be bigger than that. So we have to have visions that supersede that which we need. And then people give to that vision. And I think that's how we're going to get above this. We have to start learning how to create um, what I called uh, systems inside of our systems, right? And like, for example, um, America has an economy system, right? And in that economy system, based on what's happening in the world, is how it affects us in our economy locally, right? But what's happening in America may not affect people that's in China because they have a whole different system. It's the same with the church. The church has to create its own system so that the things that are happening in the world won't affect the church. But we're we're, 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 we're feeling the effects of the economy in the church because we're so married to a system that may be outdated or may not be working. And so we have to learn how to create new systems within the church. So really practically, we just got to be open to a flow, open to freedom, open to doing things the way God wants to do it. And I always challenge people to say this by saying, if yeah. God was to take away everything from the church that he never intended to be in the church, what would the church look like? How would it be functioning? The first church did not start with a building. The first st church started in people homes. They went house to house breaking bread, selling things and giving unto each other as they had need. What if God wants to bring us back to that, back to the beginning where the building doesn't become the greatest miracle that God does? Hmm. Yeah, that's good. That, that's good. I, I, I'm glad I want, uh, listen, y'all. <laughs> I'm gonna be even trying to write down what all he's saying. I've been trying to write down everything. Um, but the the one thing that stood out to me the most is the church has to create its own system. The church has to create her own system. And you touch base on my next question. Um, when you're talking about the vision has to supersede, because like you said, the church can have a, such a small vision where it's just not big enough. And you asked the question to the audience at Millions Conference. You said, what do you do when the vision don't match the reality? Right. What do you do when the vision don't match the reality? And I think because, you know, when the church cannot see or just refuse to foresee what God wants to do with the church, it messes up the vision. It, mess, it messes it up. So, number one, we, we, we have to explore, like he said, y'all, we have to be more open-minded, especially the fivefold ministry, the apostles, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, the pastors, all five of us has to have to work together so we can have the vision, y'all, so that we can catch up because we cannot, like he 
said, be so stuck and married to one system where the world is influencing the church when it's supposed to be the opposite way, y'all. Y'all know we right. the church is supposed to be influencing the world, right? Um, so great. So I hope y'all got that. Um, is there anything that you are off because we're going coming to the closing of the interview? Is there anything that you extra that you want to share that I did not ask, or do you have any um offerings right now that people want to say, Hey, I want to hear more about this pivot on how I can pivot. This was good. I would, I need more of this in my life just to help me get on the track. Um, do you have anything that you want to offer to the people today? Yeah, two things. So uh, again, Jamie, thank you so much for this time. I really appreciate your ministry and your platform. Um, two things. One, the system is when we think about it, let, let's use the scripture. The Bible says that there was a widow she was literally getting ready to bake a bread and eat it and die. The prophet tells her to implement a system to trust her, trust him. And he says to her, go and borrow as many jars as you can and just pull that oil in every jar and the oil will not run out until the last jar is full. Meaning that if she would have had more jars, the oil would have kept flowing. He was showing her how to create a system. That could be the church. The church can be on the end. And if we would listen to the prophet, the fivefold ministry, and get into the flow of whatever this system is, and we do as the system allows, collecting the jars, borrowing it, and then pouring what we have into that until it doesn't run out. I believe that the church is coming to that place where we create these systems. We be as practical as possible by way of the Holy Spirit. When it comes to offerings, I have I have two. One, um, you can join my uh, subscription list. It's called. It's on my link on my Instagram. Um, it's a uh, Marquise Gold on IG. If you click on my link, it's subscribe to my Pivot Life, and I'm getting ready to release a brand new book that I wrote called Invisible Paths. And this is for the people who are trying to learn how to pivot how to live this lifestyle of pivoting, how to consciously do it. And I talk about this in the Invisible Paths from the perspective that your purpose is always growing and progressing. We think that we're on, we're born with a, a defiant purpose. Like our purpose is, is in stone. Like God knows what our purpose is and this is what it is and it doesn't change. When the reality is your purpose is always evolving. If we go back to the beginning of the scripture, the Bible says that when God created Adam, Adam had a purpose and that was to watch this, be fruitful, multiply and to tend to the garden. That was his purpose. All he was supposed to do was tend to the garden. Now, as he's tending to the garden, the Bible says God saw that it wasn't good for him to be alone. After he gave him a purpose to tend to the garden, then God expands his purpose and says to him, I'm going to bring you a helper that will be suitable for you. Then he brings some animals. And when Adam did not find a helper suitable within the animals, then he put him to sleep and, bowl, and, and, bowl, and pulled out of him Eve and presented Eve to him. Adam's purpose continually expands. It evolves. Our life are filled with invisible paths. These are paths that we don't see with the natural eye, but God sees it as God sees it. He begins to reveal those paths to us, just like he did with Adam. Same thing he did with Abram. Abram did not know that there was more to his life. He never thought that he would be the father of many nations because he thought that his purpose was to assist his father. God allows his father to be removed from his life. Then God tells Abram to get up and go on an invisible journey with an invisible path that he would show him, meaning that he doesn't see it with the natural eye. Same with Moses. Moses is born and he thinks his whole purpose oh, is Lord. in Pharaoh's house. And it's not. God births him through a woman who then hides him for as long as she can, puts him in a river, rolls him down the river, this invisible path. He lands in Pharaoh's house. He learns Egyptian and the culture and all this stuff in order to discover that his purpose is to deliver the children of Israel to the to out of Egypt. He continually evolves. So your purpose is not one thing. 
you learn this lifestyle of pivoting so that God, as God evolves your purpose and you discover these invisible paths, you're not afraid to go down a path that you don't know about, you've never seen. This is how God gives you the ability to do things that you didn't go to school for, that you didn't know you were called to, that you didn't know was going to be a part of your life because it's an invisible path. You trust the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides you down this invisible path and is the path that is right beneath the surface of your natural life. And the thing that many of us don't realize is that all of us are walking paths that other people have paid for us. And this is why we're not fulfilled. Mm. This is why we're not happy. This is why God's not getting the glory out of our lives because it was never the path that God intended for you. The, the path that you're on was the start. But every step becomes invisible and you have to trust God more. So those are my two offers. Join my subscription list. My book is coming out called Invisible Paths. I'm going to help you learn how to live life on the terms that God has intended for you to live through these invisible paths. Listen, listen. <laughs> Y'all, I can listen to this man talk all day. <laughs> he is so full of wisdom and he, support, and he supports it with scripture y'all and it's practical and it makes sense and it's for the now it's a rhema word it's for the now okay y'all get the book follow him on instagram i put his instagram handle in the comments follow marquise on instagram get the book get in his mgw circle and start so soaking up all of this information y'all because listen we are in a season of preparing, pivoting, and performing so that we will not be, be caught behind on when God starts to shift this thing. You won't be, be like, oh, I'm, I, I, I'm late or I've got no. The information is there. We've been trying to pour into y'all. We're trying to do our best to get it so that when it happens, you will not be caught off guard. Okay? I want to ask one more question. What's your favorite food? <laughs> What's your favorite my food, Marquise? Food, my favorite food is ice cream, man, and it's bad. Like, I have a bad relationship with sweets. I love ice cream. I love cookies, pie. Favorite food is ice cream? Ice cream. <laughs> uh-uh. We're going to get you away from that ice cream. We're going to get you away from that ice cream in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Uh-uh, we're going, you're going to get you some kale chips or something, something, something healthier. We're going to get you away from that ice cream. Well, thank no. you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you so much to Ashley. I said hi. Hope we can do this again, y'all. Follow him on Instagram. Get the book. And thank you so much for your time. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. All right, y'all. So that was Pivot Conversation. Listen, I am full. I'm excited. I'm going to go back and watch this again and again. I apologize if the connection was just a little choppy, but the, listen to the information over and over so that you can write it out, so that you can hear what he's saying, so that you can get the material, because this is something that God wants us to pay attention to and handle now. Thank y'all so much for watching. Thank you so much for going out and actually applying those steps. Thank you so much for taking your time out. Replay, share, 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 share this video said that others can hear the importance of pivoting in this season. Amen. Love you all with the love of Christ. Until next time. Bye.